So, if you remember in your demand uh, analysis when we are discussing about it, we have identified there are a number of factors uh, which affects the level of demand like uh, what is the price of it, what is the price of substitute good, what is the income of the consumer, what is the um, future anticipation of price and what is the number of consumer in the market. Apart from this also, these are the information that helps us to know or helps us to decide the firms to know what is the level of demand, whether demand goes in an increasing way or demand goes in a decreasing way. So, in today's class, we will focus on the forecasting of the demand, how generally the firms they does the demand forecasting, keeping all the information used or maybe using all this information whatever available to them uh, for uh, knowing what will be the demand for their product in the future. So, today we will talk about uh, demand forecasting, what is basically demand forecasting, what is the need, what are the different types of demand forecasting and what are the different methods to do this demand forecasting. So, today we will focus more on the subjective method of the demand forecasting. So, initially we will know what is demand forecasting, what are the different types of demand forecasting and then we will talk about the subjective method of the demand forecasting. Now, why to forecast demand, what is the need or why generally the firms they do a market survey, they do a market research to know what is the demand. The if you look at the economic condition is always depends on the economic activities of the firm and business environment whatever the business environment that is dependent on the economic activity and since there is always a cyclical nature of the economic activity sometimes it is expand sometimes it is contract that way it also affect the business environment and that is why there is a uncertainty there is a volatility and there is some amount of risk if there is a plan and actual is not matching and also the dynamic because every it is not a static condition business environment every time it gets changes with the change in the related variable. So, demand forecasting is required to know because the environment is uncertain, it is volat it is volatile, it is dynamic and it is risky. And better business decision can be taken if the uncertainty can be eliminated or the reduce. So, if I know that it is going to be uncertain whatever the decision I am taking it may not be optimal in the future time period. So, one has to reduce the or the eliminate the uncertainty associated with it and then only that can be a better business decision or that can be a uh, profitable or the successful business decision. So, demand forecasting basically predicts the future demand of the farm products and this is one way to reduce the uncertainty because now predicting the future demand will reduce the uncertainty that what will be the demand and on that basis now the supply can be planned, now the price can be planned and there are other activities also can be planned. So, demand forecasting is basically to predict the future demand of the firm's product and this is one way to reduce uncertainty and this way we can the reduce the uncertainty may be the business decision can be also profitable and viable. So, some of the business decision making that is added by the good demand forecast. If there is a good demand forecasting, it helps in some of the business decision making. And what is the business, uh, what are the, what are those business decision which gets, uh, gets good positive outcome by demand forecasting? Determining the optimal level of output, what is the optimal level of output that can be decided through the demand forecast? because on the basis of the demand the output plan can be decided and whether at that output level the, this is the optimal level of the firm, whether the firm needs to expand, whether the firm needs to contract, whether the firms needs to, whether they can expand at the increasing cost, whether they can expand at the decreasing cost and on the finally, how they can determine the output level through the demand forecast. Then planning and scheduling the production, distribution and the transportation. So, this demand forecast helps them in scheduling the production like okay, the future demand forecast says that in the month of Jan 20 units require, month of Feb 40 units require, month of uh, March 50 units require, month of uh, April 20 units require. On that basis, the production scheduling can be done in a way so that 
it delivers 20 units in Jan, 30 units in Feb, 40 units in March and 50 unit in April matching the demand it can just deliver that. So, the production scheduling can be done if the demand forecast you know, dem the forecasted demand is known for the specific time period. Also, the distribution scheduling the distribution and scheduling the transportation because it is not that every time the producer is the supplier of the product. If it is if producer is not the supplier of the product, once they produce they have to also plan the distribution and the transportation basis, how the end product reaches to the market to the retailer and on that basis they know that okay, if Jan 20 units is required, how they have to plan that the transportation of the 20 units to reach the retailer before Jan. So, this planning scheduling of production distribution and transportation can be done if the demand forecast is known for the specific time period. Acquiring inputs typically the raw materials labor and capital if uh, if you know that what is the requirement of output in a next couple of month next couple of week accordingly the input plan can be also done that what is the raw material required for that typical output typical quantity of output, what is the required la labor, what is the required capital and that way the acquisition of the inputs can be done on the basis of the demand forecast. Demand forecast uh, helps in determining cost and pricing strategy. If the demand is more, then accordingly the pricing strategy can be done whether it is a peak time period, whether it is a off peak time period what is the kind of uh, output demand that helps in the pricing strategy that what kind of pricing can be done. And also it helps in determining that how the scale of operation should be. If the demand is more then the uh, scale of operation is more the uh, possibility is that at least the farm is getting some economies of scale. Similarly, the determining the cost like whether, whether it should be going to be a increasing cost in the scale of operation, whether it is going to be a decreasing cost in the scale of operation, this can, thing can be decided on the basis of the demand forecast. Then demand forecast helps in on decision on expansion and exit strategy of the product. How it helps in expansion and exit strategy of the product? If the demand forecast says that okay, by the end of this quarter the demand has to be 100 units. Taking specific example if it is 100 units and if a specific firm has a capability of producing only 80, 80 units through the demand forecast it helps them that they have to expand the output in order to fulfill the market demand for their product. And they can do the expansion activity on the basis that even if now at the present time period the demand is not 100 units because in next quarter it is going to be 100 units, they have to expand and produce 100 units in order to meet the demand for the product. Similarly, it also helps in exit strategy of the product because if the forecasted demand says that the market for this product is going to down, there is no there is no demand for this product, it is going to decrease or uh, maybe there is no uh, proper uh, there is no proper demand for this product. Generally that helps the farms to identify with that level of demand whether at least they are covering whatever the price they are going to charge and with that price whether at least they are covering their variable cost of production or not. If the variable cost of production is also they are not covering up, they will prefer to go out of this market. So, forecasted demand also helps in the exit strategy of the firm that if the what is the level of demand with that level of demand whether the firm can survive in the market or not if and if they can survive in the market if they cannot survive in the market where they should exit or where they should shut down their operation it can be helped through the demand forecasting. Finally, the demand forecasting also helps in the meeting the customer order dates and customer satisfaction how this customer order date and customer satisfaction is related to the demand forecast because it will give us that what is the demand from the customer in the different time period. And on that basis the firm can work on the production scheduling, the firm can work on the distribution, the firm can work on the transportation and finally that will uh, that will help in fulfilling that customer order dates on that specific day and also the customer satisfaction because whatever the demand they are doing in that time period that is getting fulfilled with the specific time period. So, forecasted demand helps in determining the optimal level of output 
planning and scheduling production distribution and transportation it helps in acquiring inputs raw material labor and capital it helps in determining the cost and pricing strategy it helps in taking decision on expansion and exit strategy for the product and it also helps in meeting the customer order dates and the customer satisfaction so demand forecasting taking all this um, uh, taking all this uh, usefulness of the demand forecasting we can say that demand forecasting is the starting point of fulfilling a customer order its accuracy is paramount that accuracy of the demand forecasting is the paramount and based on forecasted demand a firm commits its resources capability uh, for a period of time and also the capacity to create the goods and services that its customer value and willing to pay for it so forecasted demand helps the firms to do the commitment on the basis of the resources on the basis of the capacity on the basis of the capability for a time period to create goods and services for that customer and particularly customer what the what they generally value for it generally if the forecast is low it will result in lost sales opportunity and customer dissatisfaction if the forecast is not proper if whatever the forecast that is not appearing or, or it is considered as the low forecast and what is the outcome over here the outcome is the result in the low lost sales opportunity and the customer dissatisfaction whereas the high forecast will lead to accumulation of inventory resulting in higher cost and less profit for the firm so if the forecast is not proper either it can be low or it can be high if it is low generally it leads to the lost sales opportunity because firm is not ready to fulfill the demand and because the demand forecast is showing at in a lower note and that's why if it is not ready to fulfill the demand from the consumer they lost the sales opportunity and the consumer get dissatisfied that whenever the demand for the product that is not getting supplied by the firm and there is a waiting time to get their product whereas if the demand forecast is not proper and if it is forecasting very high it will lead to accumulation of inventory because whatever if it is a high forecast the product firm has already produce a higher amount of the product and if the higher amount of the product is produced and if it is not getting sold in the market because of low consumer demand that leads to accumulation of inventory which incurs a cost for maintaining or the managing the inventory which results in the higher cost because you are producing uh, at a higher level and that is not getting immediately sold and also that's why it gives less profit because supply is more demand is less and on the basis of basis of the basic uh, market forces the firm has to uh, the firm has to charge a lower price in order to also dispose of some amount of the inventory if they cannot keep it for a longer period of time so high forecast is not good low forecast is not good low forecast is also leading to negative outcome and high forecast is also leading to negative outcome for the firm the forecast accuracy plays an crucial role in determining the effectiveness and the efficiency of the firm so when it comes to a proper forecast or a good forecast it helps in the effectiveness of the firm or the efficiency of the firm now this uh, demand forecasting each uh, categorized on the basis of level of forecasting on the basis of the time period and on the basis of the nature of goods so the demand forecasting is can be uh, on the basis of level for of forecasting on the basis of the time period or on the basis of the nature of the goods so if the categorization is on the basis of the level of forecasting what are the different level one is farm level and second is the industry level so in case of farm level it refers to the forecasting of demand by an individual firm for its product so level of forecasting the first level comes in the farms level and in farms level this is the forecasting of the demand of the individual de individual farms for its product so typically when the individual farm does the forecasting for their demand for their product this is farm level and here the most important category for a manager for taking important decision related to the marketing and 
production. So, this uh, farm level uh, forecasting, demand forecasting helps the manager for taking important decision related to marketing and the production. The second level of uh, second categorization is on the basis of the industry level forecasting. And what is industry level forecasting? It refers to the demand forecasting of a product in an industry as a whole. So, it is not about a specific farms product, rather the products which comes from the industry as a whole. So, there may be multi product like if you consider suppose PNG, if you look at their product in all the segment of the all the segment, whether it is food, whether it is non food, whether it is uh, whether it is non food and also in the FMCG. So, FMCG also they have variety of product. So, when the demand forecasting is done for all this product for the ok, what is the demand forecasting for PNG as a whole that becomes the industry level and what is the farms level for typically for a toothpaste for a soap if the demand forecasting is done may be with it, it is for the dope sub or it is for the Garnier shampoo. In this case generally this is the farm level. So, industry level forecasting is done as the demand forecasting of the entire products of all the industry. It provides insight into the growth pattern of the industry because as a whole if the demand forecasting is good and uh, through the demand forecasting they are coming to know that the products are they are going to do well in the market in the long run because of their increased demand. This provide a insight into the growth pattern of the industry and this is also helps in finding out what is the relative contribution of the industry in national income. Because through demand forecasting they will know that what is the going to be the revenue, what is the going to be the uh, their contribution, what is the going to be the growth in the income and through that also they can find out what is the contribution of this specific industry in the national income. Same way when it is done in a sectoral level also it helps in finding out what is the growth of the sector in the long run and also the growth of uh, the contribution of the sectoral income in case of the national income. Then if it is in the economy level or the macro level. So, when the level when the categorization by the level of forecasting it is it is from the micro level to macro level. Micro level we talk about the farm level forecasting and then we talk about the industry level forecasting and finally, we reach to the larger scale of forecasting that is the economy or the macro level of forecasting. Here the forecasting refers to the what is the forecasting of aggregate demand in the economy. So, this is combining together all the sector, all the industry, all the firms at a specific time. What should be the aggregate demand for all the products coming out from various sector in the economy in a specific time period that is done through the economy level forecasting or the macro level for forecasting. And generally this forecasting helps in uh, policy formulation for uh, at the government level that what should be the different policy whether it is sales distribution policy, whether it is the production policy, whether it is the regulator po regulatory policy or the planning this generally helps the government in formulating different policy and also for planning in for the next time period and uh, this uh, this in the macro sense and the farm level is generally in the micro sense. Then the categorization comes in the form of the time period. So, categorization here there are two type of uh, two type of categorization one short term and second one is the long term. Short term is generally the plan, uh, forecasting usually for a period of time that is less than one year and long term this is the time horizon of 5 to 7 year and it can be also extended through 10 to 20 years. Now, what is the forecasting what we do in the short term? One with it, this is for a time period which is less than one year, it never crosses more than one year and long term we can do it uh, do the forecasting for a time horizon of 5 to 7 years and also it can be extended from 10 to 12 years. Now, what kind of forecasting we do in the short term? In the short term this is uh, to avoid generally this short term forecasting is done to avoid the under production and the over production and also to 
take a decision that what should be the inventory level, what should be the cost on the variable factor, what should be the sales target and what should be the appropriate pricing strategy to take a decision on all these things generally the short term forecasting is done. And long term forecasting is for the manpower planning, long term capital requirement, investment decision, what should be the interdependence of the industry. So, generally it is avoid, uh, generally this long term uh, is mainly for the manpower planning, long term capital requirement, because if you look at if you are doing a forecasting from 5 to 7 years that generally helps in planning for next 5 years that what, uh, what should be the demand on that basis, what should be the output and how this output is to be produced and how the demand to be uh, demand to be satisfied. So, long term forecasting is mainly for the manpower planning, long term capital requirement, investment decision and what should be the interdependence at the industry level uh, to take a decision on then that generally the forecasting helps. Then the categorization is on the basis of the nature of the goods and here we will take two categorization, one on the basis of the consumer goods and second on the basis of the capital goods. So, in case of consumer goods generally the uh, uh, categorization we do the forecasting is needed, if it is a case of the durable goods either it is the new product altogether new demand or the replacement demand and in the non durable generally the demand differs on the basis of the income level, on the basis of the social status, on the basis of the age, on the basis of the education, on the basis of the occupation of consumer. So, non durable the demand de depends on all this also on the basis of the gender. So, this durable and non durable consumer goods the forecasting is different because for this durable the forecasting is mainly on the basis of that what is the new demand is going to come and what is the replacement demand. Whereas, in case of non durable the demand changes due to all these factors and the forecasting has to be done when there is a change in the income the forecasting has to be done what happens if the social status changes, the forecasting when the age changes, the forecasting when the education level changes and also the occupation of the consumer. The second categorization is on the basis of the capital goods, here typically the nature is derived demand, because the capital goods is get uh, capital goods is used to get produce the consumer goods. So, if there is a demand for capital goods that comes from the derived demand from the consumer goods and that is why this forecasting of the capital goods demand for the capital goods generally helps in the long term growth rather than the short term whatever the short term assessment rather than it helps in the long term growth. Now, these are the steps for the demand forecasting, because demand forecasting it's a, it's a if you look at it is a very exhaustive process and these are the following are the step typical steps for a systematic demand and uh, forecasting. Now, what is the first step? First step is to understand the objective. Now, how to what is the objective for what this forecasting is being done? Whether to know the inventory, whether to know the demand, whether to understand the time, whether to understand that about the product whether to understand the whatever the dimension they want to know, which for the first thing is to understand the objective why the forecasting is being done. The second is determining the time perspective means whatever the goal within what time period this goal has to be achieved. So, determining the time perspective whether it is a short term, whether it is a long term. Then understanding and identify, identifying the customer segment, like if you the, if the product is about the younger generation, the customer segment has to come from the younger generation. If the customer segment is from the working people, if the product is for the working people, the customer segment should be the working people. If the product is for the kid, then basically we have to identify the parents who is having the small kid. So, and the first is to understand the objective, second is to determine the time perspective and third is to understand and identify the customer segments. Then after identifying the customer segment, the next task come as the identifying the major factors that influence the demand forecast. 
because whatever the factors which influence the demand forecast we need to moderate, we need to ration that and that is how we need to identify the major factors that influence the demand forecast. After doing this, determine the appropriate forecasting techn technique. What is the appropriate forecasting technique to forecast specific about the specific product in a specific time period and with a specific customer group. And finally, after determining and, uh, and the appropriate forecasting technique, we need to do the estimation and interpretation of the result. So, these are the steps generally being followed when it comes to the level of for, uh, when it comes to do the forecasting, understanding the objective, determining the time perspective, understand and identify the customer segment, identify the major factor that influence the demand forecast determining the appropriate forecasting technique and finally, the estimation and interpretation of the results. So, there are two methods of uh, demand forecasting, one that is subjective methods of demand forecasting and second there is a quantitative methods of demand forecasting. The subjective methods of demand forecasting also known as the qualitative methods of demand forecasting and this basically deals with two question what do people say and what do they do. So, this qualitative method of demand forecasting generally depends on two question or deals with two question what do people say and what do they do. And this is generally the subjective methods of or the qualitative method of demand forecasting is useful in forecasting the new product, new market for which there is no past, past data available or no information available. Under the subjective method of demand forecasting, the first method is consumer's opinion survey. Now, what is this consumer opinion survey? As the name suggests, buyers are asked about their future buying intention of products, their brand preferences and the quantity of purchase. So, generally here a survey is conducted and the survey is conducted among the buyers or the among the potential buyers. Now, what is the question being asked to them, what, whether they are going to buy this product in the future or you can say that what is their buying intention of this product in the future. If they are buying this product, which brand they will prefer and what is the quantity they are going to purchase. So, the first question is whether they are going to buy this product, second if they are buying this product, what brand they are going to buy. And second, if they are after identifying the brand, what is the amount they are going to buy? And also, additional apart from these three questions, buyers are also asked about some additional information like if the price of this typical brand is going to increase, are you still going to buy the product or you are shift your buying to some other product or are you going to still buy the same quantity or you are going to buy a different quantity. So, the possible response to increase in the price with respect to quantity with respect to the brand, probable change in the product feature like the here the question comes as okay, you like the product or you want any feature to get change with this product. So, and or the other question can be if the company is changing the feature of the product are you still buying this product or you are shifting it to a other brand or you are changing your quantity if the product feature is getting change and what is their response with respect to the competitive product. Whether you feel any product is better this than this product, what you like about that product. So, in this case of consumer opinion survey, the first question is being asked, first three question is what is the, whether they are going to buy this, if they are going to buy this switch brand they will buy and what is the quantity they are buying. And apart from that also there is some additional information they ask in the consumer opinion survey about the possible response to increase in the price, probable change in the product features and also the competitive product. So, this consumer opinion survey is done in two methods, typically the survey is done in two methods, one is census method, another is the sample method. As the name suggests, in case of census method, the entire population is being considered. So, if you feel that the consumer group is 100 people, 
Here the information will be collected, the survey will be conducted with all these 100 people. But in case of sample method, a representative sample of this 100 people will be taken. The entire 100 people will not be taken, entire 100 consumer will not be surveyed. Rather out of this maybe 20 percent, 25 percent of the people from this uh, representative sample will be chosen and they will be uh, taking on the, the survey will be taken on them and the, on that basis the estimation will be done. So, census method is one where the entire consumer group is taken into the survey and sample method is one where the representative sample of the entire consumer group will be taken for the survey. So, consumer opinion survey used if it is a small group generally they use the census method but which is time consuming and also costly. Otherwise, they take a sample method which generally deals with the representative sample and here the uh, challenge is to identifying the representative, the proper representative sample will give the insight about the entire consumer group. Stratified sampling is being followed if there is some detailed information required about the product. Otherwise, the census method and the sample method is generally used in case of the consumer opinion survey. Now, what is the merits of this consumer opinion survey? It is simple to administer, just prepare the questionnaire based on that whatever the information require. On that basis, the question can be framed and you have to go meet the consumer to know the answers or the know the response. It gives realistic results because you are meeting the uh, person who is actually buying the going to buy the product and generally suitable for the short term decisions. Then what may be the demerits here in case of the consumer opinion survey? If you are going to follow the census method, generally it is gen costly, time consuming and when it comes to the consumer opinion survey, one more uh, uh, demerits also the way they are responding to your question at that time period and when they are buying, there may be the change in their thought, there may be the change in the way they are buying it or the their buying behavior and in that case the consumer opinion survey will not help in the forecasting the demand. If the behavior has to be same during responding the question and also when they are actually buying it, then only it will be, uh, it will be helpful for demand forecasting otherwise it will not be helpful. Then we will talk about the other uh, method of uh, sub, uh, subjective method of demand forecasting that is generally the sales force composite. And what is sales force composite? Here the sales person are asked about their estimated sales target in the respective sales territory in a given period of time. And some total of such estimate form the basis of the forecasted demand. So, here it is the next level rather than the consumer. Here rather than going to each consumer, in this method generally the sales person will be asked that what is their sales target. Because when the sales person is identifying their sales target that is on the basis of the consumer demand. So, if you take the sales target that is nothing but the consumer demand in the specific time period in a specific region. So, the sales person are asked to about their estimated sales target in the their respective sales territory in a given period of time and that will be taken together to estimate the form of the basis of the forecasted demand. So, here suppose there are 10 sales person, they will ask what is your estimate of sales target in this year for the given period of time, in this particular year, in this particular segment. If that give, give this, that is the total consumer demand and we can say that okay, this is the forecasted demand. But what are the again challenges over here? Maybe it is easy because we are not targeting each and every consumer who is using or buying going to buy this product. Rather, we are we are targeting the sales person who sales person itself represent maybe the thousand consumer or two thousand consumer and they gives a better picture when it comes to that what will be the consumer demand. So, it is simple to administer because you are not going to one to one. It is also cost effective because the number gets reduced. So, the survey when the survey is being done, it, it is the number comes down and cost effective. And it gives more reliable figure because since the person who is getting interview is the salesman and salesmen they have more information about the buying behavior, 
how the consumer when they are responding to something whether this is actually this is their buying behavior whether there is a biasness or what and what are the demerits of the uh, sales force composite because since this is the one person who is representing the entire consumer group whether it's 1000 consumer or 100 consumer or the group of consumer if the sales person is biased the entire entire consumer group is biased and in that way that will be not the true representation of the consumer demand and that is why the demand forecast is not going to proper. So, if the sales person is optimistic the consumer demand will be optimistic, but it may not happen when it goes to the individual consumer is not optimistic. So, as a whole if the sales person is optimistic we need to assume that there are 1000 consumer all of them they are optimistic and similarly if the sales person is pessimistic we have to assume that the entire 100, 100 consumer group or 1000 consumer group they are also uh, pessimistic and in that way the uh, estimate of the consumer demand changes and demand forecast changes. So, if it is optimistic generally we lead into a situation of high forecast and if it is pessimistic we lead to a situation of a low forecast. This is not suitable for the long term and also this is not suitable for the when you do the aggregate for all the region because sales person is in term of that typical territory. So, taking their estimates we need to understand this may not be the total consumer demand. So, the careful identification of the sales person representing all the territory that will only give the true picture of the consumer demand or the forecaster demand otherwise it may be the regional based demand it cannot be the macro sense it cannot be the demand for across all this territory. Then uh, there is one more method known as the expert opinion method and what is expert opinion method? Here generally uh, the expert is being chosen they are called they have called for the group discussion and in the group discussion either it is by the brainstorming session or for a structure discussion and through that their opinion will be being asked for specific whatever the objective whether it is about the uh, about the demand forecasting or about the segmentation identification of the new segmentation identification of the new market uh, demand for the existing product or maybe the uh, demand for new product whatever the objective on that basis the group discussion will be moderated and the group discuss discussion either will be in the form of the brainstorming session or in the form of the structure discussion. This expert opinion method is uh, developed by Osborne in 1953 and it has actually uh, if you look at it has two techniques this expert opinion method one is group discussion where the expert meets they do the brainstorming session or the discussion and their opinion will be taken to forecast the demand. And second is the Delphi technique and Delphi technique is developed by Rand corporation and here this Rand corporation they develop this uh, technique post cold war to forecast the impact of technology on the warfare. And here Delphi technique how it is different from the group discussion getting opinion of expert without face to face interaction. Basically the expert will be chosen and they will be uh, it is not that they have to meet in a group individually they can give their opinion not on the basis of the face to face interaction and on the, on the basis of their opinion the demand will be forecasted. So, in case of extra expert opinion methods again it has subdivided into two methods one is group discussion where the expert meets do a brainstorming session and give their opinion on that basis of opinion the demand forecasting is done and second is the Delphi technology Delphi technique and in case of Delphi technique the opinion is getting uh, the opinion is um, received not through the face to face interaction and once we uh, once they get the expert opinion on the basis of the op expert opinion they do the estimate of the demand forecasting. What is the uh, merits of this expert opinion method? The experience of the expert generally helps in the getting the realistic figure and there is always a uh, there is always this whatever the requirement of the time and resource that is not uh, valid here because uh, when you do a survey you need time or also you need resources. But in case of this this is just a matter of one day when you do the group discussion you call the expert and you have a session or if it is just the expert opinion you go meet the person get the opinion and 
come back. So, in this case the time and resources is not required and also the experience of expert helps in getting a more realistic figure. What is the demerits? Here the challenge is again to identify the rational or the may be the proper expert to uh, understand the objective of the firm or the objective of the uh, typical producer why they are doing the demand forecasting. If, if the expert is biased then the entire demand forecasting goes for a toss because uh, the entire demand forecasting will be biased. And the second demerits over here is that there is a risk of loss of the confidential information to the rival firms because if it is going to the expert you are sharing some information and if you are sharing some information and in the public domain the possibility is that there is loss of confidential information of this typical firm to the rivals which is not supposed to be in the public domain or which is not supposed to be revealed. Then the other kind of uh, subjective method of demand forecasting is market simulation and in case of market simulation it is like laboratory testing of the consumer behavior. Here the artificial market will be developed and people uh, artificial market will be developed and there will be simulation on the basis of the uh, how the buyers they are going to behave or they have to record the consumer behavior during a specific time period. Okay. They will be given the money to do the buying uh, do, do the purchases and on that basis they will do the records the buying behavior and they uh, try to make it a artificial market. So, this typical simulation is developed by Graber Granger in uh, test H 1960 and this is a popular technique of the market simulation. And here if you look at how it works, generally the artificial market is created and uh, the buyers will do their purchases and on the basis of when they are doing the purchases, their buying behavior, their consumer behavior will be recorded and that will help in the market simulation. What is the merits? The merit says that this is the first kind of method where the consumer behavior is being captured in the situation where they are doing the buying and generally it helps in uh, helps in uh, doing a forecasting for the absolutely new product because consumer get acquainted with this and when they see the product on that basis the buying behavior changes and that is a good way to do the demand forecasting. Demerits, there is a requirement of the considerable amount of time and money and it may happen that the way when the artificial market the way they are behaving, they are not behaving in the same way when they are going to the real world scenario or the real market scenario. So, the possibility is that the buyers behave differently and in that case the, the entire demand forecasting is on a uh, different uh, direction not in the proper direction. Either it is uh, go on a high, high uh, direction or it is go in the low direction. Then there is a subjective method of demand forecasting that is test marketing. This is one step ahead of the market simulation and here actually the uh, rather than creating a artificial market, it is in the real market generally the buyers do the purchases they without and their behavior gets recorded and here the purchase behavior and here the buyer does not know that their behavior is getting recorded. So, this is step ahead of the market simulation where we to, uh, took the case of the artificial market, but here it is not the artificial market rather it is the real market product is actually sold in the certain segment of the market which is known as the test market and where the consumer do the purchases, consumers buy without knowing that they are being observed. So, in this case typically in the test marketing, the test market is developed, consumer they do the purchases and their consumer behavior or the buying behavior is recorded and when they are doing the purchases, they are not aware of the fact that they are being observed or they are being recorded. So, this is uh, a real market and it, this is generally called as the test marketing and this is more reliable among the qualitative methods because it is a kind of real world scenario the buyers they are doing the purchases and also they have no information that their purchase behavior is going to get studied or their purchase behavior is going to get observed. And that is why this is more reliable among the qualitative methods and suitable for generally a new product and there is less amount of risk because the buyers is the behavior of the buyers is actually in the market not in the artificial market. It is costly. 
So, if when they are uh, launching a new product, they are doing a test marketing, the entire procedure is very costly and if the product is not doing well, the failure of the product generally leads to the sunk cost. So, it is very expensive and they have to plan carefully if they are doing a test marketing, at least some level of uh, R and D is required to know that whether the product is going to have some potential in the market or not, because otherwise uh, planning a product, producing a product, doing a test marketing and if it goes in the negative direction, the failure of this product leads to the sunk. It is time consuming and when we do the test marketing, we do it in a particular location. The purchase behavior is also recorded in the observe in a particular location. So, there may be a regional differences which cannot be generalized into the entire market, because the behavior of the consumer in one segment of the market may be different from the another region of the market. So, this cannot be generalized. So, we will we'll, uh, continue our discussion on this demand forecasting typically on the quantitative methods of demand forecasting in the next session.